you have your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 4 through 13, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 4 through 13, and if I had a title for today's message, small but great. Uh, I have not dismissed any of our children because I want to make sure, I went back and forth as to whether we were going to have it or not. Um, I need every parent to hear this, and so I don't want any teachers next door, and I want you with your kids. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 4 through 13. Very quickly, before we get started, you need to understand. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for the opportunity to dedicate each soul to you today. Father, I'm asking that your very presence will be real today. Father, hide me behind the cross of Calvary and anoint my lips from on high and let everything I say and do here today glorify your name. Father, keep me in direct will of yours. Uh, Father, not my ideas nor my opinions or my thoughts, but let everything be in direct relation to the word the way you want it presented. Father God, I humbly ask for you to use this broken vessel to reach your people. In Jesus' precious, precious name, amen. amen. So in the Bible, where we are at, and, and i got to move quick. Everybody knows David and Goliath, okay? And so we're talking about King David. And at, at this point, uh, the children of Israel, God's people, they had these people called judges. And the judges ruled the land. And the people, God's people, didn't want the judges. They wanted a king because everybody else had a king. And God tried to tell them, you don't want a king. You want these judges. But the people said, we want a king. And so God granted them the desires of their heart. And they gave them a king that could be in control of them, in, in authority of them. Uh, listen, I want you to be very careful of who you grant authority in your life, who you put in charge of it, who you give access to it. Because so many of us today, it's fear that has control of our lives. It's, it's worry that has control of our lives. It's shame. It's guilt. It's all these other things. It's your job. It's, it's all these other things that have the authority over your life. And my Bible says that you can't serve two kings. And so if you're giving someone else the authority over your life, other than the king of king and the lord of the lord, there is a balancing act that you just can't keep up with. My Bible says you'll either serve the one and hate the other or hate the one and serve the other. And so be careful who you give authority over. And so God tried to warn them. They didn't want a king, but they, they had a king anyway. And so at that point, the king now is starting to take them down the wrong path. Because if you give authority to the wrong person or the wrong thing in your life, you are guaranteed to go down the wrong path. And so they are mourning this king's actions. This king is named Saul. They're mourning his actions, and God is telling them, okay, it is time now to stop mourning, and you have to put action to your mourning, and we need to replace this king because I've got somebody ready because as soon as God takes something away from your life, he makes sure he replaces it with something better. Many times the thing that you think you're missing out on is not that you're missing out on anything. He's got something better he wants to replace it with. And so these people are mourning King Saul, but they didn't realize that David was in the wake getting ready to take over. How many times have we tried to hold on things to our life thinking that it was the best that God had to offer, but you had no idea what was right around the corner to take its place. And so here is King David now. He is out in the sheep field, and Samuel is sent by God to anoint this new king. And God tells Samuel where to go look for him, but he doesn't tell him exactly what he's looking for because that's how God operates. He sends us in the right direction, but he wants us to use our God skills to figure out exactly what it is we're supposed to be looking for. Because if he tells us exactly what we're supposed to be looking for, I have found that many times we miss out on God in the very small things in life. And so Samuel is directed in the way, and he gets to David's family. Jesse is the father, and that's where we pick up in the scripture, and it says... So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him because priests didn't show up at any old time. They said, what's wrong? It's like when your preacher knocks on your door unexpectedly, you all hide and don't answer it. These people came running out and said, what's wrong? It's like when I send you a text asking you to do something and you pretend like you ignore it. I know you get it. They said, what's wrong? Do you come for peace? Samuel said, yeah, chill out. I'm coming for peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons. And he invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, and remember, God told Samuel, you go anoint this new king. He didn't know what his name was. He didn't know what he looked like. He just knew the direction in which he was supposed to walk. And when Samuel arrived, he took one look 
at Iliad. And Samuel thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. I want you to back up one second. How many looks did Samuel take? One look. Can I tell you something right now? You can't come to any judgment or rationale after one look. How many times in life do we take one look at something and we get to a judgment before we take the second look? And if we would have just stopped and took the second look, we would have realized that our first look was way off. How, how many times do you approach someone or you say something to someone or you do something and it, it's after one look that you make that? And then all of a sudden, if you just would have chilled out for a second, you would have realized that you should have taken a second look. See, here's what my Bible says. My Bible says, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them in 1 John 4, 1. Test them. You can't test the Spirit after one look. You shouldn't trust your preacher after one sermon. You shouldn't trust your preacher after two weeks. You need to test him to make sure that what he's saying is definitely directed by the Spirit. I pray that you put me on the test. And the reason I say that is I have confidence that the word that I am delivering to you does directly correlate with the word of God. And so Samuel took one look at Eliab and he said, this is the one. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge him by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. See, this is the same mistake. Anybody ever made the same mistake more than once in life? Yeah, amen. How many of y'all made the same mistake more than twice in life? How do y'all still keep making the same mistake you keep making? Yeah. And listen, here's what Samuel did. He took one look, he thought that was it, and then God says, hold it, Samuel. He says, it's the same mistake you made last time. Samuel said, what do you mean? God said, I don't judge people by their outward appearance. I know their heart. Do you remember that Saul guy that you anointed king? In 1 Samuel 9, 2, it says his son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel. He was head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Samuel, you judged him by his appearance because he looked mightier than everyone else. And now you're getting ready to make the same mistake again. You're judging their outward appearance, thinking that's the vessel I'm going to use. I view vessels differently than you. The Lord doesn't see things, as the Bible says, the same way that you see things. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his sons, Abedab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, nah, this one isn't the chosen one. Next, Jesse said, Shimei. But Samuel said, nah, that's not the chosen one. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Do you got anything else to offer me? Do you have any more sons? Do you have one more I can look at? Jesse said, they're still the youngest. But he's out in the field. He's doing the father's work. He's watching over my sheep and my goats. He's small in stature. I don't think you're going to like him, but I'll go get him. Samuel said, we're not sitting down and having dinner until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark complected. He was handsome. He had beautiful eyes. See, he met the qualifications of Samuel because Samuel was looking for something on the outside that he could agree with. But then this one that he brought forward, this one had something on the inside that God knew much better than the outward appearance that Samuel was judging him on. And the Lord said, this is the one. You anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil and he anointed David. And parents who are <coughs> dedicating your kids today, if you have your Bibles, if you have your app on your phone, if you have neither one, get a pen out, get a pencil out, borrow it, write it in blood. I want you to make sure that you understand the next sentence in this Bible because you're going to hang on to it for the rest of your life. And I mean that with authority today. I want you to make sure that you get this next point of the scripture. David was anointed with oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Amen. 
Let me tell you again, prepare, you better get this. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon his son. Powerfully. It didn't lead him the next day. It didn't lead him next month. It, it didn't lead him when he failed the Lord. It didn't lead him when he walked away from me. It said the spirit fell upon David that day from that point forward. And parents, before you bring your kid down here, I want you to understand something. We're going to pray that the Spirit of the Lord falls powerfully upon your kiddo from this day forward. Three things I need to know, and i got to move quick. I got you, camera woman. Got to move quick. Three things all of you are dedicating today, and you still have time to back out. And the reason I say that is because I, I was, it was impressed upon my heart that this, this dedication it can't just be something that we do because that's just what you do in church. It, it can't be an annual ritual that we throw out there. No, th there is an importance to this and a significance in it. Three things that after today, all you parents, you dedicate your little one. Three things are going to change. Number one, your child's going to change. They're going to be different. This is not a formality thing. Where we're not just going to stand up here and smile and take pictures. Today we are praying and we are going to anoint your kid that the Spirit of God falls upon them in a way that is undeniable. Un excuse, and they're going to fall upon them in a way that you're going to know that your child is different. When you look at them in the yard, I want you to know that they're different. When they show up at daycare tomorrow, I want everyone to know they're different. When they're playing with their friends, I want them to know that there is something set aside by that individual that God has anointed them from this day forward. Your child is going to be different. They're going to be different in the sight of your eyes. They're going to be different in the sight of their peers' eyes. They're going to be different in the sight of darkness's eyes. And God himself, they will be different in their eyes because we are going to anoint them to see them the way God has seen them from the beginning. Your child's going to be different. And, and I, because your child's different, I don't want you to pull a Jesse on them. You say, well, what do you mean to Jesse on them? See, once we anoint them today and we're going to believe in faith that the power of God is going to fall upon them, listen, don't pull a Jesse and start underestimating them and start putting them in a category or a classification or put a label on them. Don't underestimate what God's going to do for the calling of the kingdom. They may not be a doctor. They may not be a lawyer. They may not be a millionaire to bail you out of the debt that you have. They may not be the sports star that you anticipate, but they're are going to do something great in the kingdom of God. They're going to be different from today. And the way you view them is you have to understand that they are a vessel being used, maybe not in the way that we want them to be used, but they're going to be used in the way that God needs them to be used to uplift his kingdom. They're going to be different. Don't do a Jesse. Don't pull a Jesse on them. Don't say, oh yeah, I got my youngest. Uh -uh. They're going to be anointed by God today. And the spirit of the Lord will fall powerfully upon them. Number two, not only your kid's going to be different, your parenting's going to have to be different. I'm sure Jesse still beat David's butt when he was bad. <laughs> and if you're not into that thing, I'm sure he sat in the corner for timeouts after he was anointed king. But here's what I can tell you about his parenting. When, when he looked at his kid and he knew that he was going to be the ruler one day, and he knew that he was anointed by God, I don't think they missed the Sunday service. I don't think they missed grace before they ate dinner. I don't think they missed prayer time before they went to bed. I don't think they missed Bible time before they got up in the morning. I don't think that the spiritual things in life that parents are supposed to do with their kids from that point forward, I don't think Jesse missed it because he understood that he was dealing with the anointed one of God and his parenting skills had to be different. Joel, you're putting lots of pressure on us today, huh? -uh. Because watch what God says if you allow him to. See, not only is the responsibility going to fall on your shoulders to parent, but God says I, the, the responsibility is going to fall on my shoulders to parent. Watch what David wrote later on in his life. He said, for who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Parents, you, you didn't get that. Who, who can come after the anointed one? You say, well, Joel, why is that important? Because you're parenting now. There's a little less responsibility if you start giving all the responsibility to God. God will protect your anointed child from this day forward. It's, it's promised in the scripture. 
David writes for in Psalm 26, Now I know that the Lord rescues his anointed. Oh, listen, your parenting now, it's going to change because now your parenting is going to give a lot of responsibility to God and say, I've dedicated them to you. I've anointed them in front of you. Now you create them the way that you need them to be created. Listen, I, I, we're, we're going to pray a, a hedge of protection today upon your kid that God's going to protect them. And, and I want you to, to understand something. With your parenting changing, and I've heard, I hear this a lot. I know I'm not a parent, but I hear this all the time. That somebody, you know, I want my kids to experience things. I want them to try things out. They got to learn on their own. Yesterday's experiences become tomorrow's chains. Let me tell you again. Yesterday's experiences become tomorrow's chains. Get, get that loud and clear. Yesterday's experiences, they're tomorrow's chains. You keep your kid from things. I don't want to shelter them. You shelter them as long as you can by the word of God. I want them to experience. Don't know. They'll have plenty of time in life when they're under your rule and your house and your responsibility. You pray the hedge of protection of God all around them, all about them, before they leave your house, when they come back to your house, when they're out of your house. That they need to make their own decisions. They can when they're 47 years old. Until then, you make the decision. Kids can't make decisions. Half the adults can't make good decisions. Your, your parenting, your parenting is going to be different. Don't go down that path because that's what the world wants you to do. Let them, let them try things. Let them experience things. Let, let them learn. No, you teach them what's right or wrong. You teach them what the truth is because my Bible says the truth will set them free. Free. If it's in the Word of God and you don't like it, teach it anyway because it's still the truth. You teach it. Lastly, today, and I, I know I'm a little over. Church, church will, church will be different. Our kids are going to be different after today. Our parenting is going to be different after today. And our church is going to be different after today. 13, we're going to anoint today. 13, we as a church are accepting the responsibility to pray for them, not only them, but their parents. 13 of these individuals are going to be tomorrow's future of this church. This church has some longevity now. It, it, it has a future now. One of these people that we anoint may take the pulpit one day. He ain't take it anytime soon, but one day. <laughs> Well, one, of these, one of these young ones may play the guitar one day, the drums one day. One of these young ones may be teaching Sunday school one day. One, one of these young, like th this is the 13th, th this is Grace Renewed tomorrow. And, and they, they are being brought up and th this is going to keep this, this church alive. This is it. And if we, if we don't accept the responsibility as a, a church to, to pray for them daily, that they're going to face giants even though they're anointed. David was anointed and he fought Goliath, but because his, his dad, Jesse, because his parenting skills changed after the anointing, he knew to drop the armor that Saul tried to offer him and to pick up a slingshot because he knew what it was to face giants and how to defeat them. He didn't want what the world had to offer. He based his decision on picking a slingshot over what dad had taught him. If you teach your child at a young age, when they get old, they will not depart from it. These 13, they're small, but they're great. They will face a world of uncertainty, but they serve a very certain God. And the battlefield that they're stepping on is different than the battlefield that some of you have stepped on. The battlefield is different than the battlefield I've stepped on, but they're not stepping on it alone or by themselves. They're stepping on it with the anointing of God. And my Bible says when they were anointed with oil, the Spirit of God fell powerfully upon them. Powerfully. 